Welcome to Blind Men and an Elephant. These are your hosts, Neeraj and Osho. This is a podcast where two friends discuss a whole host of ideas that range from across the spectrum, from economics to culture, politics to sport. And we hope to bring our fresh perspective to things that are happening around us. We live in times where there is an information overload. So this is our attempt to make some sense of the noise. You can listen to us on all major podcast streaming apps and of course on YouTube. You can check out all our links in the description along with this episode. Okay, so let's begin today's episode, The Phenomenon of the Underdog. So, Osho, um, guess what? Champions League football is back. Whoa. So, as you know, of course, um, FC Barcelona is the team I've followed literally all my life. And uh, they had their first Champions League game this week against this new Hungarian team called Ferenc Varos. Uh, I'm sure I'm slaying the pronunciation, <laughs> but and I say new because I had never heard of them before. Um, and you know what's interesting? Even though I'd supported this Spanish team for a large part of my life, there was this part, especially in the first half, where secretly, I was actually rooting for them to win. Seriously? Can you imagine that? I mean, it's 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 so weird because, I mean, this is a team that I've always, like, looked to win all the trophies, etc. And and somehow, this, this Hungarian team playing well was was exciting me a lot. Do you know why that might be? You know, this is exactly what I've been feeling for the last week when Kings eleven Punjab, after losing, I don't know, seven games, eight games, hundred games, has suddenly started like having this crazy winning streak against everybody and now they're suddenly in contention for qualifying in the IPL. So, I think there is something about underdogs that really gets us going. Absolutely, man. And, and, I mean, just to begin, like, how do you define an underdog? Is it like any team that like keeps losing, like, or and suddenly emerges out of the ashes? Like, how do you, how would you define an underdog? No, I think an underdog is somebody who's obviously not at the top, but has some clear potential of breaking through. There's somebody. These are people who will, who have so much potential of excelling, but something hasn't gone right for them, and it's it's like it's like somebody somebody who's always challenging somebody who's always looking to mess with people at the top so that's what i think underdogs are that's super interesting man um yeah i i completely agree i think i think that's that's literally what what but but i'm trying to think like from an outsider's perspective right like what why why do we dismiss these underdogs in the first place and and what what then makes you suddenly want to take them seriously as if they actually have the potential to suddenly win what what is it that we is there a moment we're waiting for i don't know see the thing is there's always lower expectations from people who are not at the top like oh come on this team is obviously going to lose today these people are definitely never going to win so that 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 sentiment is always there and so while that failure while that failure is ex- expected anything incremental anything slightly better than that is a huge bonus like that first half that you were talking about mm. and you know the thing is these underdogs they always show some promise they make you wake up they make you sit up and take them seriously you you are then forced to consider you're forced to consider them and look at them more seriously like Hey, there's something here that we've not been noticing. You know? Yeah, absolutely. I think even if you were to just look at it from a larger, like, outside sport or whatever perspective, like, just economically or from the economic side of things, you just, you, wa- you want to see that spike in TRPs where suddenly yeah. people are just watching matches uh, or events because an underdog has suddenly started to perform. Yeah. I think it, it's, it's, it signals good times even for businesses, right? Definitely. And the thing is, and this is why sport in general is so entertaining, right? Because see, if somebody kept winning all their lives mm-hmm. or just every day you wake up and you see Barcelona or Real Madrid just take away like 100 goals and then sleep. <laughs> That's that's no fun. You would not watch them. Nobody will watch them. 
it's when you see that somebody who you want to root for who you see is going to challenge people at the top i think that's what gets us going because it evokes some kind of empathy in us that there's somebody who is not at the top somebody who's had a tough time and then we're rooting for that somebody who's had a tough time do you think it stems from this thing that we're taught as kids at least growing up in india right where you know you're supposed to share your toys you're supposed to have empathy towards others you know you're not supposed to keep dominating constantly so is it something that we learn so early in our childhood that you naturally tend to dislike people who keep dominating or keep winning over others definitely i mean nobody likes to just go to the playground every day and get whacked around by the bully right i wouldn't go to the playground exactly, ever again yeah. exactly Absolutely. and when somebody is just dominating and killing it there's no fun then they're almost a bully we've seen how some teams just make a mockery out of the other <laughs> side Absolutely. and sure like if you're a die hard fan of that team yeah it's great but that's not something you should always want to see and a, over a period of time you always want some kind of churning right absolutely i think even in like football i remember like when a team starts winning like of course there's a clear dominant and a team starts winning say 6-0 7-0 it's almost rude or it's almost considered as unsportsman like for them to continue scoring goals the way they were <laughs> it's almost looked down upon it's almost like okay you know what you've clearly won the game let's just finish it for the spirit of the game yeah and, and that's it it ends there so i think i think yeah it's 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 interesting how yeah. how this all shapes up one thing i'll ask you osho is um do you think this is evolutionary or is this something that uh, is something that is drilled into us by nature or do you think it's cultural for us to root for the underdogs so i think it's cultural for sure mm -hmm. like we've discussed evolution i'm not so sure about i'm not so sure that darwin would also agree because absolutely well, not yeah. <laughs> it's survival of the fittest and all those kinds of cruel things that we've heard so <laughs> i don't know about evolutionary but culturally definitely over over the last 2 300 years ever since we've started documenting people and documenting sport especially we've always had this drive to root for the underdog absolutely yeah that that makes a lot of sense you know this takes us to an interesting question of how do these underdogs see themselves because mm. yes we have a perspective on underdog phenomena everywhere around us but what is it like to be the underdog hmm. you know i think i think yeah i think you've hit the nail of uh, on the head because as we discussed right you no team or you know group of people who's constantly losing suddenly becomes the underdog that starts winning i think there requires some sort of uh, specific targeted uh mentality changes as well as you know situational changes that go with being an underdog and i think first one amongst them to me would be the fact that you spot that you have the challenge the the talent to challenge the status quo like actually knowing from within that hey you know what this is something that i can get done yeah like for example i mean here to just think about like even indian politics the thing that happened with aap in new yeah. delhi right yeah. it's a party that came out of nowhere and and suddenly now we see that they're uh, leading the state of delhi you know it's often about just not making the devil too scary or too big that you can't beat it so often you have to just see that look these are people who've done some things right probably but we can do it maybe we need a plan maybe things can go wrong but we can do it and i think spotting that that's what aam aadmi party did as well right they said to hell with the status quo mm -hmm. to hell with these big parties and their big money and everything we're going to go to doors we're going to knock on these doors we're going to go to every nook and corner of the city and we're going to win people's hearts that's all that they did and and in half the battle was won there because they said they showed up do you think that in this example they kind of also rewrote the rules in a certain way and sort of made people play on their terms and on their turf 
uh, wherever possible. Like, and I think we also saw this in the case of the U.S. elections, right? With Definitely. Trump. Definitely. Definitely. See, the thing is that with with underdogs, very often why they succeed to begin with is because you don't expect them. You don't you don't know how they're going to play. They just show up and then they do something crazy. You don't know. You don't know what to expect of them. And they they show up. They do something which you haven't planned for, which you haven't accounted for, mm-hmm. which, which you don't have a playbook for. And yeah. that's a, yeah. a, and that's why they that's why they surprise you. And that's why they they show a vulnerability of yours that can be exploited. So in the case of politics, for example, we all know how the general public is disenchanted with politicians. But the Congress and other established parties didn't probably think that, you know, somebody is going to come and suddenly tap into that disenchantment. But then comes up and one year later, they've done wonders in Delhi. Absolutely. And I mean, to touch upon a point I mentioned earlier, I mean, with the US election, right, like in 2016, that's that's what happened. Everyone expected Hillary Clinton to win. In fact, she got more votes. And of course, let's not get into the complications of the US electoral college system. But I mean, it was ridiculous. Like nobody expected that win. The point is that Trump won. Exactly. Yeah. And and we saw the last four years. (laughs) No, but even with Trump, First, he was considered a joke. Then he was considered a freak victory. And yeah, then sooner or later you realize, wow, Trump has really rewritten the rules of politics. Now you're all talking about what Trump has said today, what Trump has tweeted today, what Trump is going to do, what Trump is not going to do. And it all suddenly revolves around him. So it's it's often just a matter of time before an underdog really turns the tables on the existing system. Yeah, Osho, and just taking the concept of underdogs back to sport, or honestly anything, right? I think one very, very crucial defining factor that I've found in common from what I've seen is tenacity. I think just the ability to comprehend that, yes, I will see several failures along the way. Yes, I will fall. Yes, I may not be the best at what I'm doing right now. But just that insane belief in self, which then leads to that unrelentless effort or just the mentality that goes with it. I think that's something that really characterizes uh, a classic underdog, which can really challenge status quo. Yeah. And those failures, in fact, build the hunger because when you're an underdog, you're really, really hungry to win and you're really driven to shake things up. And that's why that tenacity becomes so much more important because every time you see a successful underdog story, you see that they're carrying the scars of their failures along with them. They always remember that they're avenging something which they failed at, which hurt them, where they lost. And that is something which in fact builds You know, cliched as it is, it builds character in these teams and these people to succeed. So, Osho, speaking of tenacity, I think um, a live example of a tenacious underdog, which we are seeing right now and we will continue to see now, is this podcast. The Blind Man and an Elephant is a podcast that... Ladies and gentlemen, is an underdog right now. We're going to keep recording. We're going to keep putting out our podcasts, our episodes, week after week, month after month, till somehow somebody realizes that this is, like, interesting enough to be made viral. That's the plan. So guys, shamelessly, (laughs) shameless self-plug, please hit the subscribe button and give us a like. And please share with friends and family. Thank you. Yeah, everyone who's listening, please share it with at least five other people who haven't heard of this podcast. Cool? Cool. Okay. (laughs) So getting back. Osho, so interestingly, we've been talking about the underdog, what they feel about themselves, what are the characteristics they need to have. And that's all important. But I think a very important part of the underdog story Is the overdog (laughs) or the favorite or the boss or, you know, the the, the champion. My question is, how do they perceive underdogs and what what do they see when they're faced with an underdog? I think there are 
two approaches that people take one is dismissal mm-hmm. which is laced with a lot of cockiness and complacency and the other one and this is what makes successful people really really successful is the fact that they identify these threats early and then they adapt accordingly very cool so just to touch upon um your initial point about complacency yeah i think we see this all around us and even if we move past sport you know even wars even militarily we've seen this happen in the world before we saw this in the us vietnam war in the in in the 70s and and that was insane right like a military superpower like like the united states of america which had just come off the back of winning essentially winning uh world war 2 and 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 suddenly they come to the southeast asian nation and they're completely flummoxed because they've definitely not considered them threat enough and um in that scenario like i mean i don't even know what must have transpired in their minds when they sort of had to sort of pack up and come home yeah where else do you think we see, we see the social i mean yeah in the 20th century is probably the american century where america dominated so much but it gives us such clear lessons about the underdog yeah and even in afghanistan hmm. they thought that these these bunch of local guerrilla warfare people are not going to mess with us anymore and we're probably going to just take control after 911 but look where we are mm-hmm. the uh, the americans are now packing up out of afghanistan and are doing a deal with the taliban who they thought they could just run over because they're the best military in the world but guess what <laughs> the americans really did not account for the fact that they were going to get a tough fight they were just really complacent and really arrogant about their own ability to get whatever they wanted yeah and speaking of guerrilla warfare i mean even closer to home okay i'm just reminded of like old history lessons about shivaji against the yes. mughal empire yes. right with the yes. Afga- afzal khan and yeah. all of that where this this tiny kingdom was never supposed to win but they used guerrilla warfare and smart tactics to exactly. sort of outsmart their opposition exactly. we've also seen this in the case of genghis khan yeah. who, who essentially like him and of course dynasties after essentially built the second largest uh, kingdom known to man and and that's insane like we see this time and time again through history yeah um but you know what in contrast there are also some great examples of how when people spot that there's a threat coming up when people mm-hmm. smell that an underdog is somewhere around the corner they account for it um i think something that really struck me Uh, about about this point about how you can deal with underdogs very well uh, how, how you can coach underdogs very well is what i mean is uh, if you watch this uh, show called the playbook on netflix there's there's this episode on jill ellis the the coach of the us women's national team as a uh, national football team as as many of you might know uh, won the world cup last time and they're, they're like consistent winners She says something super interesting and I'm actually going to quote her verbatim here so as not to lose the essence of what she says. She says, "If you want to sustain excellence, it is not about being the best, but it is about staying the best. You have to constantly push the envelope, get better." A year after the World Cup, we had to get ready to play in the 2016 Olympics in Brazil. And I remember the first team meeting in 2016. I said, "Congratulations. We are on top of the mountain. You're world champions and it's fantastic. But mountain tops are small and the air is thin for a reason because you're not supposed to dwell on top of the mountain. It is rented space. You get up there, enjoy the view briefly, and you must climb again what do you think osho yeah it's about the fact that you always need to make that climb you always need to prepare yourself to change what you've been doing to always reinvent 
in order to account for the fact that there's somebody else who's watching you there's somebody else <clears throat> there's somebody else who's probably coming at you because they've seen how you've succeeded and wants to either replicate it or has completely clearly understood what the flaws are that need to be exploited so before they do and before they act on it you need to account for it yourself and rectify it and change strategy yeah beautifully said uh, i think i think that's that's super important and i think that's what really um drives coaches across sport or across other other fields to really want to coach underdogs with talent rather than incumbent winners because i think if if you start coaching a team that is always used to winning there's a certain tag that goes with it that you're almost expected to win and yeah. and nothing else will do yeah and, and and i think that's that's the game right you do, you want to keep reaching those new stages you want to get up every morning and have a goal i think that's what it's all about it's always about trying to find new challenges for yourself that you're going to be excited by and that you want to conquer new mountains that you want to conquer you know and yeah that's that's basically what the philosophy of even the underdog and even the champion is absolutely i think this is a good note on which we can end this show do you want to say something before we end yes actually this is something that i wanted to address um this show is uh, an outcome of conversations that you and i have had for a long long time a- and and we know that like while we've researched it and you know we've thought about it etc it definitely is something that comes from a male gaze from from our point of view from yeah. where we've been and our experiences in, in society right and uh, osho what is your perspective on how we should rectify this i mean see we're definitely going to look out for more um, diverse voices that can be a part of this podcast but it's also probably going to be a lot about us trying to accommodate those perspectives um even though it might sound like it's coming from you know it's just probably men talking about women or men assuming what women think and how women behave or just anybody else we're probably going to succeed partially probably we're going to get some things wrong but it's going to be a good faith genuine effort to understand and convey those points as well and I, we would love to hear your thoughts on this like please leave a comment please leave a thought please let us know reach out to us on on our social uh, media platforms which we've uh, sort of included in the links below and we'd love to start a conversation we'd love to know what you think and what we can improve because as we said this is episode 2 and this is something we've just begun so thank you for tu- tuning in to this episode of blind men and an elephant thank you so much <laughs>